like to start with, with uh, the timeline for sort of where we can place ourselves in the context of sort of the early Earth. And I have uh, adapted this from uh, Stephen Freeland, who um, gave a, a really great talk and who I really like this picture of sort of our timeline of the early Earth, because I think it really puts into perspective how quickly uh, or, or how far back in time we're talking when we talk about prebiotic chemistry. So I'm just going to walk through this really quickly. The disclaimer being I am a chemist and not a geologist, um, but I'll do my best. Uh, so we've got the, um, we've got the various uh, geologic timescales here. And so if we just add in a few things here, we've got the extinction of the dinosaurs um, right up here, so very close to today. Uh, the Cambrian explosion is right about here. And then our very early, m earliest multicellular fossils are just right here at, I think, about 73? No, I'm not going to say a number. Uh, earliest mu multicellular uh, fossils are right about here. And then sort of, so that's all very, very recent in terms of the uh, of time scales that most of us are thinking about in terms of um, I think this afternoon we're transitioning a little bit more into sort of prebiotic uh, chemistry and that kind of thing. Um, and so if we continue sort of walking back in time, uh, we've got this great oxidation or great oxygen oxygenation event. Um, and obviously the exact placement of this and, and where all of that happened and whether there were whiffs of oxygen a little earlier uh, all comes into play. But we really didn't have much in the way of oxygen in the atmosphere until about 2.4 billion years ago. Uh, and keeping going back, at about 3.5 billion years ago, we had our oldest microfossils, so that's our oldest sort of direct evidence for life. And then we've got indirect evidence for life uh, that stretches back to, depending on who you talk to and depending on who you believe, uh, about 3.8 to maybe even 4 or 4.1 billion years ago. I have no particular uh, opinions on that, but there are various uh, timelines for that. And then we also have this period of the late heavy bombardment, although, again, I believe that is also somewhat up for the extent and how heavy the uh, late heavy bombardment is, is also right around 3.9 or 4 billion years ago. And when we're really thinking about prebiotic chemistry, we're really thinking about this time, obviously, before there was life, right? We have to have chemistry happening before there's life for it to be prebiotic chemistry. And part of the reason why I think prebiotic chemistry is such an interesting field is because it's really the place where we have very little in the way of geology that's sort of shaping our understanding of what the constraints were because with plate tectonics and everything, we've recycled a lot of the material that was present on the early Earth. And so right around this time period, right around when we think life was kicking off, we really run out of any constraints. You know, we, we don't really have much in the way of a rock record. And so it's really hard to know what the constraints were and everything. And, and even if you like your, you know, detrital zircons and things like that, they're these tiny little micro things, and we're extrapolating an entire planet's conditions from a very small microscopic thing. And that's great. It's the evidence that we have. But it's, I mean, given the diversity of environments that exist on Earth today, to the extent to which you know, the isotopic evidence of a small zircon can really be used to extrapolate the planet uh, conditions is, I, I think, interesting. And so I think that's what makes prebiotic chemistry such an interesting um, environment to, to sort of play around in. Uh, yeah. And so, like I was saying earlier, you know, our, our era of prebiotic chemistry, you can push it, you know, sort of whatever the dates you, you really want to pick and are your favorite. As far as I'm concerned, you could pick them. Um, but I would say that, especially given, you know, the, the, the lack of the rock record and the lack of some of those things, that a lot of those conditions are not particularly well constrained. And so we're going to have a couple talks uh, that I'm broadly putting as sort of what was there or what could be there. And so here we're thinking about what would be a possible biosignature. So Maria is going to be talking about that in terms of sort of what are some of the analyses of pyrite that we could look at um, to sort of maybe have biosignatures, maybe not exactly for the early Earth, but thinking you know, beyond that, what can we take away from what we know here? And then Chris is going to be talking about, well, how do we, how maybe can we tell what the pH conditions were like and what, where are those proxies valid and things like that? Um, and then again, I'm a chemist, so I like to think about it. And I think, you know, in its simplest case, that chemical evolution is 
broadly speaking, the journey from simple to complex. Um, and it's not a simple arrow, but you know, we, we have to represent it somehow. Um, and so I think one of the things that's really important is when we say the word complex, we really have to know what we mean by complex, right? And, and maybe it's semantics, but I think it's kind of funny. So we heard a lot this morning about how in astrochemistry, something complex is anything with greater than six carbons. And that's great, but I will remind you that the astronomer's periodic chart is hydrogen, <laughs> helium, and a whole bunch of metals. So this afternoon, we're going to be working in a slightly more, uh, in a slightly more complex uh, region of complexity. Um, and to do that, when, especially as we start to get into to bigger molecules, and this is a warm-up talk, and so I apologize to those in the room for whom this is not uh, new, but it's always good to uh, remember our skeleton structures and how to speak chemistry, especially as we get to these uh, bigger molecules. And so chemists really like skeletal structures like this. And so this is one hexene. You might also see it as C6H12. And you know, you're going to see a lot of molecules like this that kind of look like little snakes. Um, and just to, to translate, for those of you who uh, organic chemistry was a really long time ago, uh, when we represent molecules like this, the little edges here, the corners, are a carbon. And we just redact the hydrogens. So if we were to draw it all out, we've got a whole bunch of carbons. We've got six carbons. And then we've got all of these dangling hydrogens off of here. So if you're just seeing this guy or any skeleton structure that's like it, just remember that all the hydrogens exist there too, and the carbons are just in there. And I, simplification, but I always think it's, it's good to know what we're looking at, because not everybody speaks exactly the same language. Um, also, in terms of speaking chemistry, we're going to be talking a lot about molecules. And so here, this is pyruvic acid, which is a molecule that is near, to, near and dear to my heart. A lot of you will know it as pyruvate, which is the deprotonated form. And when we're thinking about something that's acidic, when we raise it into basic conditions, we lose a hydrogen and we deprotonate the molecule. So you're probably going to hear words like protonate and deprotonate. I just point this out because I gave an Avgrad Khan talk once. And like at dinner, two days later, they were like, great, but what does deprotonate mean? So I just want to you know, make sure we're, we're talking the same language. And also, we can have things like when we take this molecule and we dissolve it in water, things can happen where we can add a water molecule, we can hydrate the molecule, and we get a whole bunch of different structures that can occur. And so this is just you know, various things. pH dependent is basically how protonated or deprotonated something is, and different chemistry occurs under those conditions. Um, so that's sort of our, our basic chemistry interlude. Um, and then we can start to think about the different types of complexity. So like I said, we're moving beyond the six carbons um, as our definition of complexity. And I like to divide it into a couple different types. So I think there's molecular complexity. It's sort of how you go from a simple molecule like your fatty acids or your single amino acids and form covalent bonds to form peptides and to form you know, phospholipids and the, the useful molecules of biology. And so. What environments do we need to do that? And specifically, how do we do that without biology? So Amy's going to be telling us about one possible way of peptide formation, which is by delivery from um, exogenous sources rather than happening on the Earth itself. Um, so there's molecular complexity. There's also chemical complexity. Ooh, that got messed up. Um, where we've just got a whole bunch of mixtures of species, right? So we're not necessarily saying something about the nature of the molecules themselves, but that there are these mixtures. And there's a lot of work recently on messy chemistry. And what are the interesting and emergent properties that can happen with messy chemistry itself? But also, sometimes having this big mixture is detrimental. And so uh, John is going to be talking about uh, sort of what are the ways that we can emerge, like, that uh, chiral asymmetry and things like that can emerge as we're transitioning from non-life to life. And sort of how do we maybe, not that everybody would agree you need to escape, but at some point escape this sort of messy chemical complexity, which is just a mixture of species. And then, of course, there's supramolecular complexity, which is sort of how do we think about the larger 3D organization of molecules and sort of getting towards functionality. So there's molecules that are coming together, and they're organizing themselves into three-dimensional structures, so a protein folding or uh, the double helix or something like that. There's also having a coordination between two different molecules that are 
complexing with each other. There's putting things inside of compartments. What is the role of confinement? And where does that self-assembly occur? And how do you get vesicles? And all that kind of stuff. And we're going to have uh, three really nice talks on sort of that aspect of supramolecular complexity. Um, we're going to be thinking about sort of the assembly and the coordination. Krishna is going to be telling us about how CoA might be linked with RNA. Um, we're also going to be thinking again about self-assembly and compartmentalization with Tony, who's going to be telling us about these micro droplet compartments and how those might emerge from uh, a mixture. And we're also going to be talking about binding and functionality and sort of how proteins and things can bind metals to maybe ultimately get to functional biomolecules. Um, and then I always like to point out, uh, as you're going from simple to complex, you also have to think about there are all the forces that are driving you backwards. And so it's not a simple matter of pushing in a straight line towards complexity. I think it's really easy with any sort of evolutionary perspective to think of it as a straight line and just a complexity. But you also have to be in a condition where the back reaction is less favorable than the uh, forward reaction. And so that's a thing to keep in mind as well. And sort of when we're thinking about this, we need input of energy or something that's driving us to maintain these out of equilibrium structures. You know, life is sort of inherently out of equilibrium. As soon as, as, soon as we become part of equilibrium, that means that we're dead, right? We are no longer living. And so we need this input of energy, and how are we sustaining out of equilibrium systems? So you could have an input in energy in terms of photochemistry. You could do wet-dry cycles. There are any number of ways of getting there. But I think it's really important to not forget that there are always back reactions driving us backwards. And so uh, and then the other thing is just that the environment and the conditions of the chemistry, I think, are really important. And I think the fundamental chemical constraints are really also driven by what environments they find themselves in. And so with that, we're going to move on. And uh, happy to welcome John up to give his talk.